In this episode, I host a third dialogue between Damarato and Daniel Ingram. This time on the Vipassana meditation method of highly influential Burmese monk Mahasi Sayadaw. While Daniel's own path has been deeply informed by the Mahasi method, Damarato has critiqued it as incomplete, particularly as it was applied by the American Vipassana movements that it influenced. In this episode, Daniel and Damarato share their own experiences of the method, reflect on its changes from Mahasi to Upandita to America, and reveal rarely seen teachings from Mahasi's own writings. Daniel and Damarato also debate different approaches to working with meditation hindrances, compare the results of Mahasi practitioners to those of Fire Casino Meditation and Chuladasa's Mind Illuminated School, and address topics such as the Dark Knight, Stream Entry, and perennialism. So without further ado, Daniel Ingram and Damarato. Daniel Ingram and Damarato, welcome back to the podcast. Delightful to be here. I am so happy to see you guys. You're good friends and I really appreciate our relationship. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. I really like your smiling faces too. Well, I'm very delighted to uh, have you both back here for part three, actually, of an ongoing, it seems now, dialogue series between the, between the two of you. Very amazing. And uh, we've talked about magic in the Dharma. And we've talked also about lineage, who may teach the Dharma. And these, I think, were two very interesting discussions indeed, and they've been very popular. And, uh, but today, uh, Damarato brought it to our, to, to our attention that there was a very interesting comment in the uh, video about lineage in, in, the, in the second of your dialogues from Erald Kala. And it says, I feel like what people really want to listen to is Damarasso's method versus Daniel's method for awakening and what the criteria for each of them for fully awakening is. Damarato often criticizes Daniel's method of awakening and says the <laughs> method that he teaches is the Buddha's method. Please make it happen, Steve. Well, Erald Kala, <laughs> we have that here. And what we did derive from that, so what we decided to do from that is... Um, uh, that gosh, that's a lot more confrontational than I remember that message being. <laughs> that <kind of> <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, in fact, actually, when it comes down to it, um, a lot of this, uh, if you want, uh, discussion could center a little bit around Mahasi. So what we decided to do was talk about uh, a little bit about the Mahasi method. And of course, both of you have had contact and practiced with that method and its proponents, sitting with Upandita or Upandita Jr. and so on. Of course, Daniel, your uh, practice of the Mahasi method has been very fruitful for you. And you've written about that extensively in your book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, including your account of attaining uh, to Arhatship on retreat with Upandita Jr. And uh, Damarato, in our first interview, which we were just saying uh, before we started recording, is two years ago, almost, December 17th, 2019, way back in episode 20. You said that you were fine with Goenka retreats, but your first... 10 day retreat with Upandita uh, was the hardest you ever did. And actually your contact with that method, which you practiced, I believe for two years or so, uh, actually cemented your decision to study with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa instead. So you both have personal practice contact with that method um, and with Mahasi Sayadaw's uh, successors. So I think that's so fascinating. So perhaps um, we can start with Daniel. Daniel, would you uh, be so kind as to Talk a little bit about your background with Mahasi method, how you came into contact with it, uh, what your practice history is with it, and what the sure. outcome for you was. <clears throat> okay. So I first ran into Mahasi practice. I, I heard about it through um, Kenneth Folk and Bill Hamilton. So Kenneth Folk wandered out to California and met Bill Hamilton. And this is somewhere around 1990, 91-ish, somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly. And um, this is when I was in college and he met Bill Hamilton and Bill Hamilton had studied at IMS for years, had been there, had started Dharma Seed Tape Library and IMS was initially um, teaching a bunch of different methods and still do, but they, um, Mahasi Saida had came, had, sorry, had come to them in I think 1979 or 80, somewhere around there and taught the three month retreat. And they noticed that in comparison to whatever they were doing before, they got a lot more people getting deeper, more powerful insights. And they kind of never looked back in some ways, though they have modified a bunch 
since then what they're doing with approaches that do have more integration of content and psychology and a little softer methods and a little less emphasis on the deep dive in some ways, which uh, they felt was more skillful for a Western audience. And, but still the, the influence remains and it was very influential on Joseph Goldstein and a number of the other teachers there. And so I did my first retreat then at IMS in 1994, but it was actually Thai Forest with Christopher Titmus and Charter Rogel, who's a mix of Vipassana and Vedanta, and a guy named Jose Rezig. So the first retreat I ever did at 94 in August was a nine day, and that was actually Thai Forest stuff, which is very, very similar just without the noting. It was paying attention to the, the breath and paying attention to sensations as they come and go and three characteristics and noticing just how things are and trying not to be lost in the stories and tape loops of the mind, pretty standard Vipassana stuff, and sitting and walking, alternating 45 minute periods. And then I did another retreat with them, 17 days in Bodh Gaya. But then my third retreat, I um, went to the Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center where I sat with Saida Urujinda for about 12 days. And during that retreat, I learned Mahasi Sadao noting. And like on the previous retreats, on the previous two treats, I, sorry, retreats, I got to what I think of as the arising and passing away. I had a powerful, energetic, kundalini-ish, you know, rapturous, high, heady, awesome experience. And then I would crash into something very dark and existentially um, crisis-y. And that happened on this third retreat as well. But on this third retreat, when that happened, and I was doing Mahasi Saido noting, which would be noting the rise and you know, fall of the abdomen with an internal word, rising, falling, and noticing, wandering, and feeling, and hearing, and seeing. So it was just using an, an internal note to ground oneself in the moving of one's feet, sitting on the cushion. And this was hour sitting, hour walking, hour sitting, hour walking, starting at four something in the morning. So this is in going to like 10 at night. So this is even more intense than what I was doing at, at IMS and the Thai forest, I say the Thai monastery in Bodh Gaya. So um, similar, but even more strenuous. And so I went through all this stuff, but on, on the 10th day, when I had crashed into what I would call reobservation and the very challenging end of restlessness, whereas a few days before I could sit for four hours in a row with relatively little pain and tremendous joy, and suddenly I was feeling incredibly irritated and restless when I would even try to sit down for a minute, and it was very, very challenging to sit with the complicated, harsh sensations that the body was filled with, but they played this tape. And the tape was able to name all the stages I had gone through in sequence, in order. It was an old scratchy tape they'd played hundreds or thousands of times. I don't know. It sounded like thousands. It was pretty low quality. And they and um, they were able to identify all the stages I had gone through. And that was the first time I had run into the maps. And it gave me tremendous faith that what was next was equanimity. And that they said, if you just note and pay attention to things as they come and go and arise and vanish, then... Um, you will attain to equanimity, and equanimity is the stage before stream entry. And this gave me faith that was just unbelievable. And I think this is actually one of the missing ingredients for a lot of Westerners somehow, is faith. And Damarato and I have talked about this, and I think you will likely agree. I was so utterly astounded that they were able to know what I had gone through and had mapped it and clearly knew the territory that my faith suddenly was off the charts and the restlessness seemed irrelevant in the in the you know, comparison to the power of the faith in the method and the teachings and the teacher and the power of the Buddha Dhamma. And so I noted through all of the incredible pain and irritation, all of a sudden found myself in this vast, open, flowing, sometimes formless, incredibly expansive, very neutral, but somehow yet still delightful, equanimous space. And then the retreat ended. And I crashed back into the dark night and made something of a mess of my life, my service project in India. But I managed to go on a fourth retreat with Christopher Titmus et al. and Fred Van Allman and Norman Feldman and um, yeah, all those excellent people. And their combination of influences, I think, coupled with the incredible faith I had, having seen the method you know, produce these powerful effects, coupled with the amazing, beautiful setting of the Thai monastery in Bodh Gaya and just the sense of place it being in Bodh Gaya. It had this mythic resonance. It had this beauty to it. There were the monks there. There was the beautiful temple. There was the beautiful Dhamma teachings. And somehow I was able to just note, 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 and things move through the stages of insight, but I knew exactly what they were. I had tremendous faith that I knew, okay, this is the, the highs, this is the lows, this is the weirds, this is the openness. And then you just... At this point, I felt like there was really not much to do. And at that point, I was actually just sitting. I had stopped noting. I was just sitting in the flow of meditative experiences unfolding. And then 
uh, all of a sudden whoop, things synchronized and disappeared and reappeared and i was never the same since and suddenly i had access to all these states and stages and i you know i had access to review practice and repeat fruitions and cycles and i call that stream entry and people can debate whether or not they think that was or not but that's what it seemed like to me at the time and still does um however many years later and so i was very very impressed <coughs> by the methods but i also was had been reading a lot of books and about other parts of the buddha dhamma <laughs> excuse me, including jhanas, including training in sila, include, including all these other sutras. By this point, I had a lot of access to texts and was reading Vasudhi Maga and Majimini Kaya, which had just recently come out, um, the, the um, wisdom edition. And so, uh, and had a lot of exposure to other teachers. So I'd had exposure but that by that point to Subana and to Sharda and to Fred Van Allman, Norman Feldman, Yvonne Weir. And I think something in the mix of that, all these different styles actually combined to produce what happened to me. So it wasn't just Mahasi, but Mahasi was an important part of the mix. And then I went and started sitting a lot with Bhante Gunaratana because he was the closest meditation center to me um, in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, and I was in North Carolina. And so then I got a lot of sort of jhana and Sri Lankan style and that kind of very traditional Buddha Dhamma taught from a very monastic point of view and very scholarly. And also you could feel the depths of his practice. And I started playing around with casinos and jhanas and all kinds of stuff. So actually, while I'm known for Mahasi stuff, it, it, I actually played around with a lot of technologies and had a lot of influences that happened to combine to produce those results. So I'm going to stop there because I was talking for a long time. Um, and maybe later we can get to my story later with um, uh, Saida Upandita Jr. So anyway, so that was my uh, exposure to Mahasi. But I will definitely say, having helped teach this to a lot of people, I've definitely seen this go both ways. And I've seen people who, when they got to Mahasi, all of a sudden it was like a revelation, like a light went on, like, oh my gosh, this, this is home. And that's what it felt like to me. But I know other people who that is not their experience. And so I, I look when I look back at the Buddhist text, I see that he gave all these different methods to all these different people from like, you know, one guy who was not very smart and he just had him rub a, a rock with a cloth, I think, you know, it was a very simple method for that person. And some people did jhanas and some people did powers and some people were dry insight workers and some, some people did all these different things. And I think that's really the important thing about the Buddha Dhamma is the the skillful means, the vastness of its methods, the various options. And I'm incredibly grateful to have been exposed to a wide range of teachings and teachers, which I think helped to produce the results that I got. So I'll stop there. Thoughts? Well, yeah, it's it's very interesting indeed. And perhaps before I ask Damarato about his experience of, with the Mahasi method and, and its um, proponents, I could ask you, it might be useful to say, who was Mahasi Sayadaw? And what, in your opinion, differentiates his approach uh, or the particular emphasis, should we say, of his style or, or, or method from other meditation approaches, in, in particular Buddhist meditation approaches? Is, is it possible to give that sort of a summary as to who he was? And what, what, what do you think is, differentiates that when people say Mahasi method? What, what are we talking about? Go ahead, Daniel. You can okay, it. fair. Um, so Mahasi Sadao was a monk in Burma, and uh, in the, I think, I can't remember if he was born late 1800s or early 1900s, um, but was uh, a, a, trained in a style that was very much suddenly influenced by reaction to colonialism, to um, a sense of wanting a pure, effective dharma, to um, uh, in a style that was very influenced by the commentaries, Vasudhi Maga, Vimudhi Maga, um, as well as a uh, sutta um, called One by One as They Occurred, which is one of the probably slightly later suttas, the Majimini Kaya, that starts to have that sort of Sariputta-ish style. It's more analytical, clearly uh, drifting towards sort of a more, more Abhidhamic approach. And this kind of style of noting um, that the, the big revelation and change or thing that they did was a lot of people were not meditating much. Even monks and nuns were not necessarily meditating that much. And the notion that they should meditate a lot in very high doses was somewhat actually radical at the time. And the notion that they should use this particular technique was very controversial at the time. And then the real interesting thing came when he started teaching this in very intense doses, like three month retreats with, you know, 16 to 18 hours a day of hour, 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 hour practice sitting walking sitting walking to lay people which was relatively um unusual to put it gently 
And uh, he writes about this in his books about all the controversy he faced when doing this. But he got some very, very powerful results. And a lot of people uh, got um, amazing effects and paths and, and all kinds of things. But um, yeah, very controversial at the time. And it was the sort of notion of should you do insight before you had done a bunch of jhana? Should you do insight training before you had done a bunch of concentration training? And was this sort of ignoring one major part of the Buddhist path or is momentary concentration right concentration? And then they got into all these kind of debates. And clearly for some it worked and for some it didn't, right? Which has been true for Buddhist methods throughout the ages. Um, so there's nothing new about that. But then he he was so appreciated in some ways and his scholarship so powerful that he then actually chaired the Sixth Buddhist Council, which I think happened in 1954 to 56, something like that, where like something like 2,500 um, monastics gathered together and recited the whole of the canon and tried to solidify doctrine. And this is the sixth time that had happened in 2,500 years. So it was a major event and a major honor. And then he um, actually died uh, before I had a chance to meet him, um, but I got to study with people who had studied with him and with people who had studied under mm -hmm. someone who studied with him. So, yeah. And so that's a little bit about Mahasi Saidao. Uh, was that helpful? What do you think, uh, Damarato? Does that sound about accurate? You, you touch most of the bases. Um, so I was there in 1982, right after he died. Mm. And so there was a lot of anti-celebration going on. Mm. Uh, but I did spend uh, several days with Upandita uh, and uh, found language as a difficulty. He didn't speak English very well. But later, uh, I think it was in November of 1983 that um, I went down to uh, Kopangan to do a retreat with him. And so uh, it was at that retreat, I had actually come from Watsu and Milk. I'd spent months at Watsu and Milk, but this was kind of like finishing off or polishing off the practice with, with the Mahasa method. Um, that it was actually, uh, I, I would prefer to do what we were doing at Watsu and Milk rather than doing the Mahasa method because I knew that what the instructions were given were actually missing an important ingredient. And so I knew it then. But that was a really hard retreat for me. And one of the reasons why it was a very difficult retreat was because the floor was especially hard. And also uh, it was, uh, the talks were given in Burmese and then translated into Chinese but there was no English language lectures and it was very hard to get any English language translation done in the individual group to our individual sessions that I had with Utandita. And he seemed to be really preoccupied with all of the other stuff anyway. And, and I think the reason for that was because of the situation was who was there and the Chinese influence and why he was in Burma, uh, out of Burma in Malaysia and because visas were a great big difficulty and all of that kind of stuff. And here I am out of a hundred people, a really odd man out. The only one who was native, uh, not, you know, <laughs> don't speak the language and everything was different and all of that. That sounds really hard and suboptimal. I'm sorry, that's, yeah. Not a good introduction. And Upandita was not the nicest of people in person most of the time, though I've heard rare people. Oh, I didn't of want to mention that part. Yeah, he, I mean, yeah. <laughs> he's a tough dude. Yeah. But you could also say that that's what uh, one of the qualities of an Arahat is that they're lions or tough dudes. You don't mess with Arahats. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to be the case, but you, you, you can both correct me if I'm wrong, that the method that we call the Mahasi method has been extremely influential. And, and for some listeners, this will, this will be familiar ground, but for some, perhaps not. Um, in particular, particularly in American Buddhism, uh, some of Mahasi Sayadaw's famous students, Manindraji, for example, or Deepama, yeah. them both very, very, um, uh, if you want, uh, influential figures on 
the sorts of people like Joseph Goldstein, Goldstein as you mentioned, Sharon Salzberg, um, and uh, yeah, we, we don't need to go down the whole list. Just ask your question. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's interesting because in your critique or your discussion, Damarato, of the Mahasi method, you have I have heard you differentiate in other places. This is why I bring it up between the method as as taught by Mahasi himself and the method as taught by Upandita um, and the method as practiced in an American context or Western context. And you have differentiated your, if you want, uh, reflections or discussions on those different uh, on the changes that have occurred through there. So I'm wondering if you could perhaps talk a bit about that. I know you've speculated that Upandita's personality, which we've just has just been brought up, may, may have actually influenced the tone of the method somehow. Uh, Upandita, of course, being uh, Mahasi Sayadaw's successor. So yes, could you perhaps talk about how you see the method having? Uh, w- what was Mahasi teaching? And did it change with Upandita? And how has it changed again in uh, American or Western Buddhism? Well, the the first part of the question, I'm not an expert at, because I wasn't in Burma. I didn't know Mahasi directly. That all that I have from him is the writings, but the writings that I get seem to be correct, but weak on certain points. And then with Upandita, the points that were weak in the Mahasi got even weaker with Upandita. And by the time they got to Western Buddhism, it disappeared altogether. And the the point that I'm making that got weaker and weaker is how important it is to remove the hindrances as soon as you can wake up to see that they're there and throw them out that this has gotten quite weak in the Western tradition in the sense of noting, and the, the answer is, what do I know? Note whatever's there. And that's not the teaching of the Buddha, to just note what's there. We know what's there, we make a discernment, and if that's an unwholesome, unopiate thought, we remove it immediately. That we move from unwholesome thoughts to wholesome thoughts, and then with the Anapanasati Sutta, we, it fills in a little bit of the gap in the sense, well, what is a wholesome thought? A wholesome thought is that which gladdens the mind, perks the mind up, gets the mind strong, gets the mind um, fit and capable of work. The kind of thoughts that make us feel satisfied and content rather than wanting something. And, and Western people come to, West, come to Buddhist meditation wanting a whole lot of things. And because of that, they practice a whole lot of things that they want, rather than recognizing no, really become satisfied with the way things are right now. So we practice gladdening the mind in the sense of throwing out all the things that we want. In fact, that's one of the classical definitions of dukkha, is wanting things that we don't have. And so if we would just simply throw those wanting thoughts out and don't want anything, and in fact, practice having thoughts of being satisfied and alert and wakeful and grateful that we can, in fact, wake up, as opposed to disappointed when we wake up to find out that we weren't awake, we were asleep in hindrances. And so we go right back into the hindrances again, rather than coming out of them and staying out of them. And so in the work with jhana, we talk about it in the sense of applied and sustained thought. We apply the mind to the wholesome and then sustain the thoughts to the wholesome and keep applying and sustaining and applying and sustaining almost like a rhythm unremittingly until it begins to, let us say, have an effect upon the way that we feel. We literally over and over again begin to talk ourselves into feeling good because we're having wholesome thoughts and that wholesome thoughts about safety and security and comfortable and uh, satisfied. And by the way, safety, security, comfort, and uh, satisfaction is the precise definition of the word sukha. And sukha is the exact opposite of dukkha. And so we literally talk ourselves out of suffering and into feeling good, feeling pleasurable, which is actually the practice then of the Eightfold Noble Path of Swati to wake up to what we're doing and see it. 
to wake up and smell the coffee or to wake up and see what's going on inside the mind, the kind of thought that we have, is that wholesome? Is that thought worth having right now? Do I really have to write that email one more time before I don't do it? Writing it in my mind over and over and over again and never actually putting it down on paper. Why should I even bother thinking about it? I've, already, I've been there, done that. I thought about it already. I don't need to think about it again. And so we, we recognize, okay, don't have to do that now. I can just relax. There's no place to go right now and nothing to do. The rain comes and the air is sweet and all is survive. Everything is okay and comfortable. And so this is basically how we talk ourselves into that state of first jhana, which has the applied and sustained thought completely free from hindrances and has the sukha. And when we build that into, um, uh, let us say, the shwada or the sada, which is tra uh, translated often as faith in Western Buddhism, but really means the confidence of I can clean my mind out again. I've cleaned my mind out before. I can clean my mind out again. I can do it again. I can do it again. I can do it. The little puppet belly or the little engine that said he could. Okay, that's it's a, a gaining a positive attitude that my life does not suck anymore, that my life is okay. I'm satisfied now. And that brings on at the highest level a feeling of elation, a feeling of wowness, a feeling of... Uh, I dare say the word rapture because that's the word that's often translated in from the Pali word that means pity. And pity sukha are almost always referred to together in the Pali. But especially in the Sambo Jhana, the seven factors of enlightenment, it's pity sukha. That's the thing that needs to be there unremitting keep bringing that up and bringing it up and bringing it up over and over and over again. And pretty soon, one's right effort becomes actually an energy because we've got that right attitude of the can do. And so this is how we fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment is through the practice of the Satipatthana, which Mahasi was really strong on the Satipatthana, but he was missing that word about gladdening the mind and only referred to the hindrances as, oh, you've got to get rid of the hindrances and then you go from there. Only when it gets to Western Buddhism, they say, oh, we're doing noting and you have to note. Well, actually, the noting is absolutely what we need to do when the mind is fit for work, not when it's polluted. We have to clean it out first, and then we can do the noting. And what is it that we know? We know the jhana factors. We know applied and sustained thought. We know, is this sukha? Is this pity? Then we begin to notice, is the pity and the sukha relationship such as I would prefer sukha over pity because pity is a bit energetic to be in that state of wow all the time. <laughs> and, and so uh, that begins to melt into opaca also. So that's basically the, the path that, that I'm mentioning and that's actually in that sutta number 111, one by one as they occur that you referred to, that that's the order of it. But in there, the first thing that happens is, you said, quite secluded from unwholesome thoughts, quite secluded from unwholesome states, Sariputta enters into and abides in and abides in the first jhana with applied and sustained thoughts. And from there, he does the noting. And the noting that's to be done is the jhana factors themselves as they melt away and also the, the, uh, the parts of the seven factors of enlightenment or the, the uh, Eightfold Noble Path, whichever way you prefer to look at it. But that's the way the things that we note completely hold some things until the mind just is so enthusiastic about how good you feel, you don't bother to talk yourself into it anymore. So that's basically uh, the distinctions between the Mahasi method, but it's not really uh, something that's wrong with the Mahasi method itself, but rather that it's um, um, it it has to do with that it's that it's evolved that the real practice some some pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have gotten missing over time. And, and that we can actually just label that piece that's missing as uh, removal of the hindrances so that the mind can be in first jhana. 
Now, one point that, that Dan mentioned was the dry versus the wet in the sense, are we going to do no John at all? We're just going to go out no noting no matter how much the man that mind is messed up, no matter how dirty it is, no matter how many hindrances, we're just going to note whatever's there. As opposed to, oh, you got to be way up in the high jhanas. You can't do anything until you got them all to where the Buddhist path is a middle path. And that middle path then can be seen as the first jhana. That's the base where you want to land. That if you're in the jhanas, then where if when you come out of the jhanas, where you want to land is back in first jhana, not in the hindrances. And if you're in hindrances, the only thing you really need to do is to come out of the hindrances. And it doesn't matter how subtle you are in, in positive thinking or just being positive rather than thinking positive. But it's just being out of the hindrances is the important point. This is why the Buddha actually in Sutta number 36 says that the first jhana is the path to enlightenment. And so that's it. That's where we got to get is get these hindrances out of the mind. That's the one piece of the puzzle that's missing. And when you don't have that piece of puzzle, they call it dry. Damn. Yeah. I would Go actually ahead. agree with an impressive amount of what you said, actually. Um, and <laughs> uh, so, so I'm just going to add a few things. Like I was reading through this book, which is by Mahasi Saidao, and it goes into a long story as if the Buddha's uh, life and asceticism and everything. And he mentions how skillful it is that the Buddha then used jhana as a basis then to do insight. So this is a Mahasi Saidao book you can probably not find anywhere as it's one of these Asian publications that you may not be able to get Mahasi's series number one anyway. Um, and then I was actually looking in, of course, Manual of Insight by Mahasi Saidao. And it's funny, it says here, delight and calm, experiencing delight with every noting mind is the enlightened factor of delight. The mental calm yeah, or tranquility that it. results from effortless practice is the enlightenment factor of tranquility, effortless practice. <laughs> These qualities of delight and calm are very obvious, especially in the beginning of the insight knowledge of the arising and passing away, at which point one will feel greater delight and tranquility than one has ever felt before, verifying the Buddhist statement, the delight in Dhamma surpasses all delights. In all activities, such as walking, standing, sitting, lying down, bending, stretching, and so on, one will feel well in body and mind. Due to delight, one may feel as if one is swaying back and forth in a hammock. Due to calmness, one may not note any object, feeling as if one's gaze um, so one is gazing at or just sitting calmly. These mental states of delight and tranquility um, only occur um, sorry, only occur occasionally beginning with the insight knowledge of dissolution, but they often gain momentum with insight knowledge of equanimity towards formations. So he is, I mean, That's he's mentioning all the, <laughs> all of the seven factors, and this is in the traditional stuff. And what's interesting <laughs> is even if that's not stated sometimes, and I will agree, Upandita had sort of a darkness to him, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, but, but Thank you for saying it so I don't yes. have to. <laughs> so in fact, I was telling a funny story, someone may appreciate this. Um, Kenneth Folk, when he came back from his, his retreat uh, with Upandita, he would sing the song, um, Don't cry for me, Upandita. You know, I never liked you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's sort of pointing out the fact that he could be pretty harsh and um yell at people and do other stuff that was not conducive to a calm and happy mind sometimes um and perhaps he had his reasons i'm sure teaching western students was pretty frustrating perhaps so, the easy thing to say would be that that if you had to have someone who passed the baton from mahasasawada on into the future the designate of Upadita was not the best choice. Well, there were a number of other people who also were lineage teachers from Mahasi, mm -hmm. such as Ujanaka Bhavamsa um, and Ukundala, and I think there were others. So, and who had different personality styles and different emphases. Apparently, Ukundala was very into jhanas and things. So, um, so I've been told. I never sat with him. And so, you, you, but Upandita was the one that had the most influence here in the West. I don't know about Burma. But I think he took over the center, and apparently, he was sort of chosen for his administrative and organizational skills and ability. Well, he became to run the boss things. because he was bossy. Yeah, that's, that's what I've heard. That yeah. So anyway, but um, I'm still very grateful to him. I mean, actually, his books in this very Absolutely. life and on the path of freedom were very influential for me. And I found them very helpful, actually. And I think the Dhamma in them is quite good. 
Uh, and so, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is the spirit of the monastery. When I went to the Mal Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center, and I've only, that's the only Mahasi monastery I've ever sat in, I sat there twice, but it was delightful. The whole place was delightful. The teachers who taught me were delightful. They were happy, inspiring, smiley, joyful people. The people who came there and served and cooked the food were joyful. The sense of reverence and beauty of the center, the way they tended the place, the care for the place, the, the whole sense of the place was joyful. It was baked in. <laughs> and so that's the interesting thing. Like, even if you don't see the emphasis in certain teachings or techniques, like it was kind of there. It's almost like telling fish about water. That was just what they did right? The, the way they served us food, <laughs> the sense of delight that we were practicing, the sense of like, oh my golly, there are these people who have come to do this honorable thing. This is so great. It was just, in, the whole place was just dripping with this sense of appreciative, faithful joy. And I think that carried something like, and, and so, and I wonder how that got lost because it was so palpable in the culture, in the spirit, in the sense of Precisely. faith and beauty of the thing that that just I, it was infectious for me. And so they didn't have to say it. They just were being it. And so it just kind of I was swept up in that. It was very, very uh -huh. easy to be very inspired in that environment, or at least I found it. So um, it, again, it felt like coming home to something for me. And I know not everybody has that feeling when they get there to these places, no, but actually, I found it infectious. Actually, what you're saying is that you found the Sangha. That's mm. what the Sangha is really all about, is people yes. who are mutually in, uh, in the stream of the Dhamma, and delightfully so, and they live their lives delightfully together. That's what I found at Watsu and Mok, and that I found in many other temples in the United States and places that I stayed. I didn't see that with Upandita, but the reason I think part of it had to do with the fact that 90% of these, the people who were around him, he was only monk, I think maybe there was a, one other monk there, and all the rest of them were elderly Chinese women. Mm. And that had some influence on the situation, but joy, not a chance. <laughs> mm. And also it was a center in Malaysia rather than a Wat. He didn't go to a Wat, he went to a meditation center. And it seems like that the place where you find the most misery is meditation centers where all the miserable people go once a week to meditate together and they wind up being miserable together instead. There's no well, I don't know. there. <laughs> Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center was sort of a Wat, but it was also a meditation center. I mean, like on it Sundays- It was by the all time the... you got there. That was 15 years later. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, but was it was there. a delightful place. Well, and they grew up. Yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point. Or they grew into a sangha, which was the whole intention. And I think they gained insight because a, a number of the people were not shy about the fact that they might have stream entry or second path or something. They would hint it or even outright say it. Um, and so, and that was a bunch of the lay people that were helping to support the place. And you could feel their Within deep, inspired, sangha, generous is. delight. Within a sangha, it is open. That's the yeah. whole point, that, that it needs to be kept secret around ordinary people because they take pot shots at it instead of relishing it. Yeah, but there was, so, yeah, so there was this incredible sense, you can do this and this works and it worked for us and please join us in the Dhamma. So I found it incredibly inviting and welcoming and inspiring. And Although I actually found that in place, basically every place I sat, there were rare exceptions, but um, yeah, so I, I guess I got lucky. All right. Well, here's my question for you then, Dan. How can we do that again and again and again in Western Buddhism? Because that's the ingredient that's missing. The removal of the hindrances in one each individual's mind every time they can remember it and also remove all of our garbage around other people in the Sangha so that we act nobly within the noble Sangha because we remember to act nobly within the noble Sangha because that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I have actually spent so little time in places in the last 15 years or so that I may be slightly out of touch, but the digital community that I've cultivated, I generally find quite delightful. There are exceptions, 
but people who delight in the, the Dhamma and practice and plunging and exploring the mind and the various techniques to um, figure out how to make things better, um, I've found to be really okay. fun. And yet you and also talk delightful. about the fact that you find a whole lot of people that go through dark nights of the soul and miseries and all true. kinds of problems and all of that kind of stuff. Those are the folks that I'm talking about that need right. Sangha. They yes, need they a do. fact where they can go practice to be mindful and not just because they're sitting on the floor squatting or walking in a, a formalized style, but doing it moment by moment, living throughout the day. That's the whole point is, is that there's no real reason for that solid, hardcore sitting, that that only is just getting the mind going so that you can remember that you're supposed to be practicing with every breath you take. And to give a little bit of pushback, it is true that if you are able to really engage with the noting and actually do the technique, that the noting itself takes up a tremendous amount of mind thinking time. Mm -hmm. And if you're actually noting sensation after sensation, second after second, there is, and you're doing it freshly, like, okay, that is a fresh object. I'm really meeting it with presence and then noting it rather than falling into a repetitive thing that the thoughts can then sneak in through. Then there is very, very little time for any hindrances. There's just sort that of sensations like as fast as you can hard. go. That's working yeah. way too hard. That's not right effort. Well, this is complicated. And so I would say that different techniques tend to work for different people. And um, I actually think it's funny. I was reading back through the Mahasi books, and there is this sense that one gets of, of a somewhat aversive type, right? Where pleasure clearly holds no charge for him. He writes from this place again and again that, like, unattracted, That's way unrepelled. At the end of the pleasure. You have to right. go through heaven before you come out the other side to say, been there, done that. You do not say, been there, done that to heaven when you haven't been there and done that. And I hear that, and I appreciate that point of view. And, and I actually have wondered a lot about the personality styles. So, for example, pleasure does not hold my mind very easily. Jhanas are not very attractive to me. They weren't in the beginning, and they, it was only in the middle part of my path that I began to sort of appreciate them. But it was easy for me, at least, to tear reality to shreds, and I had a tolerance for my reality dissolving into incomprehensible, sputtering particle chaos. But not everybody does. Um, and I actually found something sort of weirdly delightful in it, because when the mind was dissolving into complicated, sputtery particle chaos, it certainly wasn't stuck in the hindrances um, most of the time. But not everybody likes that at all. And some people find, find it very, very disconcerting and incredibly and existentially threatening. And that's, that's a hindrance, the absolutely. Hindrance. Not liking that is the hindrance. And so I actually think that, that we need to discuss with various people their, their personality style their relationship to pleasure and pain, their tolerance for the sense of their body or mind dissolving or disappearing or being impermanent, their trauma history, their, their sense of their goals and where they are in their life at that point, and find teachings and techniques that are appropriate for them. And for some, that will be a, just a lot of training in sila and community. And for some, that might be jhana stuff. And for some, maybe insight. I think there are people who straight out of the gate can do insight stuff, but it's certainly not everyone. And in fact, I would claim it's less than half of people. The experiment at IMS clearly shows that when you tell a whole bunch of people to do Mahasi side out noting, literally half of them can't do it and will get lost in their content and hindrances and psychology. And so, and that's apparently true year after year there. So, um, so this is definitely not for everyone. And, and I would say, rather than say, this is exactly the path or this is exactly not the path, rather, I would say, that there's a range of possible styles which may work differently for different people and sometimes a mix of careful questioning and experimentation and and watching what happens as people try various methods based on best guesses um, of where they are and, and being able to have the flexibility to adapt and change and say, oh, wait, you're going too far this way. Oh, wait, you're going too far that way. Oh, wait, you don't have enough of this now. Oh, wait, you're falling into this trap. And to be able to, to balance in when people do need more joy and gladness and faith and rapture and happiness to make sure to, to have techniques that offer that. And, you know, but otherwise, when people might be getting sort of stuck in those things, which can happen uh -huh. too, then maybe 
it's good to counterbalance with some more energy and investigation and mindfulness. And I so I actually think of it as more of like a counterbalancing right. seven factors and making sure all are in the mix than saying this is the, this is the only technique or the best technique for everyone, because I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Well, we can, we can say it. First off, I would like to say congratulations. You're a master psychologist. <laughs> And I understand that uh, everybody wears socks. Some people wear argyle. Some people wear fancy socks. Some people in the wintertime have very thick socks. There's all kinds of different socks. The only point that we're making here is, is that all these various kinds of socks, no matter what kind of socks people wear, they all get dirty and need to be washed. That's sure, sure. where that's where we're coming from. And so uh, one of the ways that we can address this is perhaps by hypothetically asking the question of, okay, in what circumstances with what people, is it okay for them to wallow in hanging in hindrances because they've got other more important work to do? Well, or I don't think wallowing in hindrances that, is ever a good idea. So okay, I, I, so I and, and if you read my book, you will see that I'm, a, I'm not a fan I, of anybody wallowing in read. hindrances. I don't, I don't read, but anyway, because <laughs> I'm blind. But, oh no. Um, so the point is, is that uh, the real question would be how do then, if the number one job is just to remove the hindrances, how do we remove the hindrances? And that's the place where you can come in and say that you've got this technique to get rid of this hindrance, you got that technique to get rid of that hindrance and, and whatnot like that. But basically recognizing a hindrance is a hindrance is the important point. And once the student begins to understand this is a hindrance, that's 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 a hindrance but this is not a hindrance. That's when they stop dealing with all of those hindrances because they set them down, but we pick them right back up again. And so the question is, or can you remember to set it down again and to keep setting down these hindrances? Because if you set down the hindrances, you've got no problems. In fact, nobody ever had any problems. The only thing that they did have was hindrances that they call problems. And when they set the problems down, they set their hindrance down, and then you've got no problem, you've got no worry. The question is, can you remember that what you're thinking about is a hindrance, is a problem? You're creating it. And when you stop creating the problem, you've got no problem. And so that's kind of one size fits all, but it's not really necessary one size fits all because we've got to remember that people wear all these different kinds of socks. The only point that we're making is, is that socks get dirty and need to be cleaned. Sure. And then it's just a question of best washing methods from a certain point of view. Uh, actually, I don't even care about that. It's th I, I would rather just get a new pair of socks and throw the dirty ones out. <laughs> or better still, just not put new socks on, which is eventually what they will get into doing if they get into the Dama far enough. Nice. Because we, we wear those socks, they get dirty. <laughs> Hey, Guru Steve, you must have been, um, or Guru Viking, you must have uh, had some experience with people doing various Mahasi things and, and, or trying various methods and, and had people report this. What's been your experience with seeing the results, both good and bad? What's your take on this from your point of view at the moment? I don't think we want to introduce my point of view into this mix. Uh, it's quite divergent from both of you, I think. Interesting. Are you, are you sure you don't want to add it in? Because it might be really interesting to hear. Yes, Actually, because... Go on, go on Dan. Okay. I would say, Dan, already that we're in full agreement. I'm 100% in agreement with everything you said. I don't. So maybe we need a little controversy. Anything. Well, good. Huh? Well, there I, is I, no I, contro I don't see a controversy. I, I see with you. that it also. took you a different path to come to the same point. In fact, after you, while, while you were and after you read that passage, there was nothing left to say. With the conversation was over at that particular <laughs> point. So, Guru Steve, what you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, like I said, I think 
my my view isn't really isn't really uh, is, is is rather divergent, and based on I think significant less experience and know how. So perhaps I could uh, contribute by asking another question. So some oh you have to say some. Yeah, it's just if if you were having a pause or wondering, I, was, I had one more thought. I hmm. actually got to teach um, at a place called uh, Dharma uh, um, Dharma Treasure um, out in Arizona for a month. And I got to teach, uh, um, I don't know, it was like probably 17 or 20 people that came through during the month. I can't remember, something like that. And some people stayed for various periods of time. And it was a, a TMI center, so the mind illuminated. And so some people were coming there for that. And I had some familiarity with the book. I had actually reviewed the book before publication and things. And and it's got a lot of relatively straightforward criteria and methods. And this is um, Chula Dasa stuff. And so there were some people who were coming there to study that because that was the kind of center it was. And then some people knew I was going to be there and they wanted to study Mahasi Sidao practice. And then some people, uh, when they got there or also knowing, uh, knowing I had done a lot of fire casino, which is what I do when I re teach retreats now or go on retreats or help really, I don't teach them in the same in that kind of sense we really co-adventure together and help each other out but doing fire casino which is old textual stuff and which is from a certain point of view sort of a jhanic technique though people get into insights with it as well and it's based on just looking at a light closing your eyes following nimittas or whatever you see opening your eyes again looking at the light source closing your Precisely. eyes and it following whatever you see the buddha himself used it's an old old method yeah i think fact, it's pre-buddhist well, what he did was he changed it from the outside fire to the inside fire. Yeah. All of the Satipatthana is the various elements like casino meditations or a mud pie, or we have water meditations. You have sky meditations and the sky. We have uh, astrology, astronomy, weather, all kinds of uh, human arts that come out of sky gazing. The sky gazing has been there for many, many, many hundreds of years. It's the best thing you do. I mean, it's the ancient people's te uh, television. Yeah, just to sit and watch the night sky. So uh, these meditations that were practiced were done naturally because people had time on their hands to do this kind of stuff. But even though some of them became quite excellent with these meditations, just like the Buddha, it doesn't matter how deep into the meditations of the jhanas you go, if you're not doing the right things when you get there, then you're wasting your time because when you come out of that state, you're still back into your old normal habit-filled self. Yeah. So and, the interesting... and so taking it from in from outside casinos with fire meditations and start looking at the fire and the smoke that we're creating on the inside of the mind and, yeah. and start putting that fire out and <laughs> then that's the difference between all of those old practices and the time of, of of the Buddha. But there are some values. In fact, I used to practice them as the casino meditations. I mean, guys, I've been there, done that. I did, I did <laughs> meditations for 15 years, 10 years before I got to pick a Buddha doctor. Been doing nice. all kinds of stuff. So the interesting thing was I got to compare these three groups, actually. One that was doing TMI with a lot of emphasis on stability of uh -huh. mind and attention and um, working with hindrances. And one Mahasi Saidao noting, usually quite fast and very precise, very technical, very analytical, seeing intentions arise before actions, seeing mental impressions arise after sensations, seeing exactly what sense store everything came from and how fast they could arise and vanish and actually dropping the noting as quickly as possible in favor of just direct investigation of six sense doors and three characteristics. And then the fire casino people and so I got to see these three methods and kind of compare them. It was a relatively small sample, but I think some trends were, that emerged that were quite interesting to me. And the first was that the Mahasi kids um, moved as fast as anyone else from an insight point of view. So the, And when I say as fast as anyone else, I mean as fast as, as the fire casino kids. So the fire casino and the Mahasi people from a pure insight point of view were the fastest in terms of moving through insight stages. But they each paid a price for that, and the, but the prices were different. So the Mahasi people were definitely the edgiest, right? They were definitely the, sort of the most volatile in terms of their highs and lows and the, like, you know, rising and passing away to dark night fear and stuff. But they also had by far the best kind of technical analytical skills from an Abhidhamic point of view of being able to see and precisely describe the states of mind, the, the shifts, the impermanence, the, the part, you know, sort of mind moments and all of that. They were the best technical practitioners, period, 
but they also paid a price in edginess and volatility. Although I think most of them, once they got through the challenging stages and were pointed to a more open, expansive state of mind um, and more open flow stuff and mm -hmm. all of that, were able to do quite well and get to equanimity relatively right. quickly. They developed, and I think, they developed really strong skills and yes. the skills that they developed were the skills of noting. And so they could actually note and see these hindrances. Yes. But because they could note and see the hindrances, but they didn't have that one key, and that is just to use the right effort to throw that stuff out so that you don't stay edgy. But in fact, by noting the edginess, they actually multiplied in a way. For a little bit. And then most of them broke out to equanimity and did well. And then, but then the fire casino kids, which in theory is a shamatha technique, also went through a lot of insight stages. It just had all this color and stuff. And they were adding mantras and stuff in, which is also traditional from the texts recommended. And then um, they, they got into all these powers and they actually got together as this group to discuss and sort of delight in all the wild and interesting stuff that was happening to them. It was very sort of, uh, you know, entities and energies and all these strange things. But it was interesting from an insight point of view, they moved as fast as the Mahasi kids and they were much happier and they were actually much more connected as a group processing this stuff, but they were way weirder. I mean, no question, like talking about shadow demons and putting out stars and, you know, entities and, and relationships to things. Exactly. Exactly. You get the idea. And so, but they were still I having fun. I got a fun. tree here. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there was, there was a lot of fun to it, actually. And they really had a sort of a delightful spirit. And it was the most, most social of the three. And then there were the, the TMI kids who were by far the most stable. Um, their highs were not as high. Their lows were not as low. Uh, they moved more slowly, but it was a lot, it seemed a lot safer. It was, it was vastly less weird and vastly less edgy. And so, um, and and I, it was interesting to see these three different um, techniques that all in theory are sort of insighty, concentration-y in some ways, and yet to see them produce somewhat different results. Though from a certain point of view, all were moving through insight stages, uh, as I would think of them. And then- I, will, so, I wonder what a fourth group would have been, Mike, where the actual intention for this fourth group was- Just to be happy. matter which one of these three things you're doing, get your mind cleaned out and get it happy and get cheerful and sure. and uh, uh, watch what you're doing and, start and I think practicing the, the jhana. And I think the setting and the sangha and the beauty of nature and hopefully my cheerful instruction and the sense of getting to do something special and beautiful did in, have some ability to infuse some of that. And we did actually talk about that's hindrances exactly right. in fact, when, that's one when of they the arose. That we can understand that, see, I'm talking it up because we bet we're on our own line. What yeah. you were doing, you were actually exuding it which is the, what, what I try to do with the students anyway, that it's not necessarily, oh, go be happy. <laughs> but you got to actually be happy when you tell them to go be happy. <laughs> yeah, and so, but anyway, but it was interesting to see all of these different methods. And then uh, there was another person there who's actually doing this sort of very open Dzogchen-ish kind of practice. Um, and he had just this much more sort of spacious, immediate quality to him as sort of Dzogchen-y, mahamudra -y practices do right and so um and it was interesting to see the various effects but yeah and then i think it's a question of yeah trying to infuse that joy into all of it because there was a certain delight that people generally took in being able to practice these things it is a priv you know it is a delightful privilege and amazing thing that one can do so just wanted to sort of put that out there as as something and most of the time these days if i'm going to go on a retreat i would choose fire casino and we are, do it with less silence, more social during meals, a lot of fun sharing stories, and we're more playful about it. So I think that element of play and socializing and fun helps helps infuse it with some of that spirit that I also very much appreciate. And that's now my favorite thing to do these days and has been for a number of years, actually. So. Okay. Well, now here's something that we can look at then in the sense of of uh, the timeline or how far in one's development do they go before they begin to change their attitude about it. Because everyone comes into the meditation as a victim wanting something out of the meditation. And eventually persons get satisfied. If we can teach the students, your first job is to get out of wanting things and get into satisfaction. And then your path will be quick and easy. 
But if you, in fact, don't tell the students that, hey, your primary job is to get rid of these hindrances, be glad in the mind to perk the mind up and then do the fire casino and get something out of it. Then it'll be a whip to do fire casino rather than I worried about what I got here while I'm doing the fire casino. And I don't get much out of this fire casino because I'm not thinking about fire casinos. I'm thinking about how much that damn place cost. No. <laughs> Actually, weirdly enough, our retreats have been oddly affordable. We, one of the retreats we did in southern Germany, no, I'm just in a farm in the Alps, I'm, I'm, the whole thing was like thirty-eight dollars a day. Actually, for this amazing food and great place, so yeah, it's pretty cheap. No, Sorry. I think six dollars a day is expensive. <laughs> yeah, Thailand, yeah, yeah, I'm in Thailand. <laughs> well, let me let me ask this. Um, it seems like you're agreeing that hindrances are bad uh, or that one doesn't want to linger in the hindrances. Let's put it that way. And uh, Well, let us I'm, not I'm call right. them bad. Let's call them teachers and let's not uh, put it in that context, but rather that the hindrances are wrapped up with the dukkha, that they're inseparable. And the hindrances are also wrapped up with compassion is the funny thing. So this is what I try to point people to is the compassion part, because suffering, desire, and compassion are all oddly built together. In fact, compassion to suffer with, or is, is related, you know, the word passion and suffering. And so um, then if you look at actually the hindrances, the wanting to be happy is a caring for yourself. And there's a way to actually tune wanting to that to be quality. Happy of is a hindrance. Wanting to be happy is a hindrance. Sort of. But if you tune it the right way, you can actually tune into the compassion for yourself. The wanting to be happy mm -hmm. has under it that, that compassionate desire. It has under it that love for yourself, for things to be okay. And even anger. Anger has in it the wanting for you know something not to have happened or not to be happening. And then sadness you know, has that same quality. But what's interesting is if you tune back into these, they're superficial or sort of first and second tier things are very unpleasant and clearly can be very challenging. But the, 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 the deeper layer, if you turn it back in and actually find it, you can find all of these things are wanting you and, and or others to be happy and well. So desire, um, and, and, and so it, there is a way, there, so there are multiple ways to deal with the hindrances. And one is to, to push them away and to substitute something else. One is to you know, recognize the suffering in them. This is from the removal of distracting thoughts. One of them is to substitute for them. But the one I find one of the more interesting, if you can do it, which not everybody can, is to transmute these things through looking at their essential thing, which is just a wanting to be well. And that fundamental wanting to be well, I think is that sort of one fortunate attachment. Pushing them away and substituting something else is exactly what you're talking about here. You're just giving it a sweeter flavor. So I like your okay. sugar. Let's sugar Fair. this thing up and stomp <laughs> on those uh, hindrances with great delight. <laughs> <laughs> that in fact, the Buddha uses an example of that in Sutta number 19 of the, the cow herd that actually has got to get his cows from the, the place out to the pasture and he's got to pass through a village. And he carries a stick with him to whack the cows to keep them from eating the, uh, uh, the vendor's food or stomping on a child or going into the ladies' laundry or things like this. And so when the cows start to go off the path, he whacks them. And that keeps the cows on line. And then when the cows get out to the place where they're supposed to be, now he can let them uh, let the cows eat. He doesn't have to stand there with a stick anymore. He can go sit under a tree and keep an eye on them. So that's the definition of the second John. The first John is that you've got to whack those cows to get them in line so that you've got one wholesome thought after another wholesome thought after a wholesome thought. So yeah, let's whack those hindrances. Ah, I caught you, and out you go. And now I can a, be happy. It's got a Rinzai beauty to it. <laughs> Pardon? It's got a Rinzai Zen beauty to it. But I think there are a lot of different methods, actually. So um, reflecting well, the on... the only gave one. All the others are just other people's methods. Okay. This is, well, this, and when I say it, this is not my method or the way that I'm seeing the sutras. No, this is actually in the sutras. And the monks in Thailand and Bipa Buddha Dasa and all of them, they read this and say, yeah, that's exactly what it means. There's right. only one one... Uh, Bhikkhu Buddhadasa actually had quite a battle, not a battle. I mean, it was he was criticized basically 
but they never could prove him wrong when he said that the Buddha only taught one meditation, and that was Anapanasati. That was the only meditation that he ever taught. I don't. I wouldn't go so far as even call it a meditation. I would call it the Buddha's method of practicing the Buddha's eightfold noble path. That's just it. That's Anapanasati. And so any method that's just like that, for instance, the Mahasi method is Anapanasati with all the various features of it that's right there, except that various people put various emphasis upon the various meditation that the Buddha had as a whole package. And so that's why you're seeing diversity where I see unity. There's only one meditation practice, and that's Anapanasati, which has to do with sati, to wake up and look at what you're doing and make a change right here, right now. If I can change my mind right here, right now, then I don't have any problems right here, right now. And if I can do that once, I can do it again, and I can do it over and over and over again, and now we're free. And everybody can practice it that way. There's no need to have diversity in various people's practice of trying to solve various problems that they come when they can just throw whatever problem it is out. And then it's the question of, uh, from if from that point of view, how to throw all the problems out. And then there's lots of different no, methods. No, we only setting... have one. We can't have but one in the mind at a time. We don't have a whole bunch of problems. We can only have one problem, and that's the one we're thinking of. Well, but also I'm talking about the methods of removal. So you've mentioned a lot, actually. So one one method of removal is to be in a conducive setting. One method of removal is to have uh, to do things that generate faith, such as reflection on the Buddha, the Dhamma, the effects of the beautiful you know, practice. Thoughts. So, um, you know, there's the setting, there's the associating with people of glad mind and uh, like mind. That's having wholesome thoughts again. That's the Buddha's method. No, right. So... Um, yeah, but lots of different ways of achieving these kinds of things. And even I also found in my own experience, I found noting once I really understood it to be delightful because I found it powerful, effective, revealing, and the substituting of a note, which was reflecting of a sense of presence um, to what was going on in this moment. This is it. Right. And I also found uh, gladdening and powerful. And so Lots of different, you know, and I think uh, this the note is a skillful thought, right? A note that says, ah, I have seen what this is. I have accomplished a moment of clarity. That in and of itself, I found a delightful, skillful thing. And so... Um, Just do it uh, again. Right, exactly. And again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. Guru Steve, you smi you've been smiling a bunch. I'm wondering if you're having thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> that's a loaded question yes although all the time i'm afraid but um re relevant to this conversation i'm wondering if we could talk about the 16 stages of insight actually now uh, b both of you have discussed those uh, as they're as they're uh, should we say laid out in the mahasi method so to say and daniel is you have said in, in certain places that um that map of insight that is is a map of the sort of uh, territory that a contemplative practitioner will go through uh, perhaps spending more time here or there or more extreme uh, in certain place uh, certain places than others for different people but that it's a sort of perennial map that describes contemplative experience in general and, e and that even contemplatives who are not practicing that specific technique or, or following that particular path are likely to traverse at least very, very similar uh, territory to what's described in the map. And actually, Damarato, you have um, discussed that map in, in somewhat different terms, and you've said that it's only a part of, uh, of uh, Sotapanna, you could say, not the whole path. You've, you've also mentioned, actually, and this is kind of interesting, I think the dark night of the soul uh, is not, you said, this is a direct quote, the dark night of soul is not part of the Buddha's teaching, you said. That's and right, it's not. That's a Christian yeah. teaching. And you've, you've actually, that, but the I'd like to ask you about, I would like to ask you about that, actually, because you have this uh, very hilarious, very funny phrase, where's my magic Jesus? You you talk about where's my magic <laughs> Jesus as, as <laughs> yeah. But of course, 
Daniel, I, I believe, and of course, feel free as I've mischaracterized both of you, no doubt, um, that a dark night of a type is inevitable for all contemplative practitioners. Does it have to be a uh, deep, profound, um, life destroying dark night? No, not necessarily. It might just be, uh, you know, a bad, uh, you know, a bad uh, mood for, for a period of time. But anyway, it seems that you're, you've said that the dark night is more perennial, actually, uh, than that. So perhaps you could uh, correct me, Daniel, I'm sure I've mischaracterized you. And then I'd be very curious, Damarato, as to your uh, critique, if you like, or reflections on the way that the 16 stages of insight are, are sometimes used in, in a Mahasi method, and particularly in American Buddhism. So just a bit of history here. So I think we're, we're coming from a similar place and I'm going to anticipate because I've had some of these conversations with Don Murato already before I can't remember if online or in person. Um, I'm going to anticipate some of his critiques and set up some history. So hopefully we can just move on from those points. The first point is that if you look at the stages of meditation, you find in the oldest text, you find the jhanas. And you do not necessarily find the stages of insight, certainly not in their forms as they later came to become uh, defined in the Abhidhamma. The, the oldest thing you can find, as far as I can tell, is in the Patisambi Damaga, which is in the Kudaka Nikaya, sort of miscellaneous basket of generally older stuff. So those who say this is not traditional or very old stuff, I think they're right. I think these are, these are later developments um, that came somewhere, uh, you know, some, I'm not sure exactly how far after the Buddha, maybe a hundred years or two, I'm not sure. Um, it's, Actually, it's hard that's to tell. from the second century AD, the Pedersen Bindimaga, about 200 years before the Vasudhi Maga. Well, now actually, so the, oh, that's curious because it actually looks like a prototypical thing to the Vimudi Maga, which was first century AD, if I understand it correctly. And so I didn't know the Vimudi Maga would be first. I may because... have gotten those backwards. I'm an old anyway, man now. <laughs> so the Vimudi Maga, I think, is first century AD, which is about 400 years before the Vasudhi Maga. And we find the full stages of insight in um, the Vimudi Maga, but even in the Patisambi Maga, however old Not it is, we find. Not all 16 stages. In fact, four or five of them are lumped into one. And uh, well, so... um, yes, the early ones. So mind and body cause and effect three characteristics. It kind of starts off with the arising and passing away in some ways. Um, okay, so just to, so so we're clear that this is sort of later stage Buddhism, commentarial Buddhism, Abhidhamic Buddhism, which I understand that Buddhadasa and some of the Thai forest people are not much into, to put it gently. And so I appreciate those critiques. And so we can anticipate um, Dhammarato having those kinds of. Uh, things. But one, what one does find, what one does find is that the Buddha, who had a lot of powerful paramis, obviously, and had been deeply trained in jhana practice. They're even just paramis. You call them powerful because you want them. Okay, fair. But um, so the great- You've already the got them. They're, they're just ordinary. You've been there, done that. Sure. Okay. But it, it, I think in the text, it says rooted in the 10 perfections or something, um, the 10 paramis, if I've got this right. Well, the stories... Even the 10 paramis were not in the suttas. That comes from later stuff, and it's a whole hodgepodge of things. It doesn't look okay. like it other than just nice attributes, but they don't look like that they're a list of things that the Buddha would get. Interesting. And so we find in the story of the Buddha's awakening that he apparently was tempted by Mara in various ways. And I think we find this in at least two places. I think there's a Vinaya version and a, and a um, okay. Majimini Kaya here, version or something. We anyway. must understand that Mara is actually his own hindrances, his own views, his own thought forms, that it's not a separate being out there, a Mara that's floating with wings or a guru bird or something like that, that Mara is a state of mind that we're in or a thought kind of complex that we're in. Certainly one way of interpreting it, and I will d debate whether or not the traditional people would actually think of Mara as fully as a thought construct rather than having a, some sort of entity like status. It depends like upon whether they're noble or not and take the noble perspective of whether they're looking at it in an ordinary magical perspective. All right. I, I hear that interpretation um, and can see its pros and cons. And so anyway, but the Buddha, um, you know, uh, was tempted by sensuous desire, was tempted by like a shower of rocks and mud, was tempted by, you know, charging elephants or whatever, all kinds of stuff. And so even, even the Buddha um, coming up in this had a bunch of challenging things that uh, he reports having happened in his own clearly superlative practice. And 
given that but we all it's not- have those things we all have animal char- uh elephants charging we all have those things and th- that's the mara that we have to deal with the the actual bears in the child's closet or the monsters under the bed when we grow up we have our own monsters sure that's i hear mara. that and so so then the, the 16 stages of insight, which I'm, for those not familiar, I'm just going to list them very quickly, would be mind and body. So it's seeing thoughts as thoughts and physical sensations as physical sensations, cause and effect, seeing intentions lead to actions, mm-hmm. seeing mental impressions follow from other sensations, seeing this lead to that, seeing a thought lead to a feeling, a feeling lead to a thought, and seeing the, the relationship. The three characteristics, which That's usually- That's not involves, in the 16 stages of insight, as far as I know, not those particular things that you're talking about. Those are adjuncts. They're not part of the list of the 16 stages. Those insight. are definitely in the the um, the Surimaga. So, and I can't remember Vimudimaga. I could pull it off my shelf. It's literally sitting right there, but whatever. Anyway, the point is that, <laughs> that um. Uh, then next three characteristics, though, this tends to involve like hard physical pain can be sort of challenging postural asymmetries, movement, strange things, beginning of sort of Kundalini stuff, which Kundalini is not a word you'll find in the Buddhist texts, but energy um, and rapture, various grades of sure rapture. You it's, sure you do. It's, it, the Pali word is pity. Yeah, so that's right. The five grades of rapture. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to say you're not going to find the word Kundalini and you're not going to find the word dark night, which is my Jack Cornfield influence, you know, retrofitting of a Christian set of concepts over what would be called the Dukanyanas or knowledges of suffering, right? So which would be stages five through 10. But anyway, so the next would be the arising and passing away and energy, gladness, joy, zealousness, um, a lot of powerful mental factors usually. Um, the ability to see things at a very fine-grained level, very excited about practice. Usually there's exceptions that could be an hour talk. And then dissolution, fear, misery, disgust, which kind of comes as a package, desire for deliverance and reobservation are traditionally listed as the challenging stages. And then uh, upekanyana or equanimity jnana. And then, um, then one would get paths, so traditional stages of awakening. And this would be the listing of the 16 insight stages. And, and just to clarify my point on this, I have seen people go all the way through with no obvious challenges at all. No, no, not knowledge of suffering that were obvious. They, they just cruised through them. They had very little stuff there from a Bill Hamilton stuff model point of view, very little Sankaras or whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, they, they just moved through it and it was essentially undetectable. And other people who found this very, very challenging and needed a lot of help and everything in between. And um, it is definitely well, The question possible. then is how soon are they going to wake up? The sure. longer it takes for them to wake up to remove the hindrances, then the deeper into the dungeon they'll go. That the is true. The deeper into Dukkha. To some place down I that totally line agree. of Dukkha is when you go deep enough, some people even call it rock bottom. Whatever yes. your rock bottom is, my rock bottom happens to be only about three inches down. <laughs> <laughs> For other people, they just dig and dig and dig and dig until they hit rock bottom. Then, in fact, this is a, uh, an aspect that you can see that in society and AA is an example of it, that people have to hit rock bottom. So the place of rock bottom is when people recognize they've gone too far. This is too much. That's when they make that turnaround. In other words, we're talking about step six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11 on the 16 stages of insight, which is fear, misery, disgust, despair, uh, um, and a desire strong for deliverance desire, and reobservation. A yeah. Strong desire to get out of it. And that's when the strong desire to get out of it is, is that that means now I have to start throwing these hindrances out of the mind. Finally, I'm going to start, but why don't we start meditation that way? Why do we have to go for 50 years? I know people who are practicing 50 years and still have these dark nights of the soul because yes. they, they, they just uh, don't really redouble the effort enough. And then after that, uh, redoubling the effort, guess what you find is the Four Noble Truths, actually the place where we should start. So if everybody would start, the 16 stages of, of uh, insight at step 11, then we'd be good to go. Well, that's and actually what Zogchen attempts. All of the dark night of the soul should have been before they ever started meditation. 
so curiously enough, to, to try to start an equanimity is actually what Zogchen and Suhuma, Sutta Mahamudra both attempt, and as well as Zazen, and I think um, some of Dogen's teachings, as well as certain Thai forest styles, which either originally or retrospectively were influenced by those kinds of teachings. It's hard to tell the cause and effect of it, actually, given that the complexities that happened, I think, in the 17 and 1800s and how much of that was kind of wiped out in terms of being able to trace the influences um, by the reform that happened in Thailand and blah, blah, blah. But the point is that um, that Dzogchen starts with this, right? So Dzogchen begins with an open, spacious, clear mind right, that uh, allows things to just pass through like the sky is sort of what it's attempting to do. So if you look at books like I Shift into Freedom. I imagine that a lot of that sky had a whole bunch of clouds in it for him. Yes, I think most people find that. That's true. But yet um, there are, so just sort of, you know, um, there are different ways you can play this. And one of the ways to play this is starting with an open expansive space, which is going to like deactivate the default mode network, make thoughts be these very wispy little things, a few bodily sensations Would of challenge, just a few little what things. what they call um, uh, choiceless awareness, that choiceless awareness, that kind of open sure. everything. Is open yeah, open right. monitoring. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's, right. they're all That's in that when same the general. Come in, the storm clouds come, the hindrances come back. They met, well, it depends on the person, and I think it depends on the stage of practice, and everybody I've found is, is a little bit different and how they respond to that. And so um, some people, when well, you give them that— don't make it too complicated, though, because no. everybody's doing the same thing. They're just do doing it at a different point of time. When it, Here's a possible example. I've already mentioned this with Steve. Imagine that you've gone into a really modern kitchen and you check to see, you know, you're talking to somebody and, and you're talking for a while and you see the stove is not on. And so you put your elbow on the stove or you put your hand on the stove because you know it's not wrong. And you get a searing, scalding reaction and it's 300 degrees and you immediately jerk your arm back from that stove. From then on, that's a very big insight. That would be like step 11 in the uh, 16 stages of insight where you have a strong desire to not burn your arm in again. And so you're going to be careful about every stove that you get around to make sure that that stove is not burning before you put your arm on it. So that's the way that we can think of is that some insights are very big. The question is when along the way do people figure out that, hey, I'm not gonna do that, that hurts. Are they gonna do that with a great big injury? Are they going to do that with, um, just a ticket from the police rather than an accident? Or are they going to wake up because they heard somebody talk about, don't have an automobile accident, watch where you're driving. You know, there's many different ways that people can wake up. But the question is, are they going to wake up? Or And uh, uh, by waking up, that means to have some sati to start recognizing that the things that they're doing are dangerous and painful. Just like putting my hand on, a, on the stove without noticing that the stove was on. I think they've got modern stoves that are like that. The really, really modern stoves, you don't even know that it's hot. Induction stoves, um, unless yeah. it's had a pot on it, which will get it somewhat hot. But if it doesn't have a pot on it, then they don't get hot. So the lady just took the pot off the stove and there I am walking in the kitchen without checking to see that that pot, <laughs> that, <laughs> that stove is still hot from the pot. It just got taken off. So that's the point that I'm making is, is that we need to keep checking things out to see, is this dangerous? Is this dangerous? Is this a cow pie? Is this another bunny turd? Whatever it is, we need to make sure that we're not going to step in it. We're not going to touch it. Uh, the Pali term for this, that one of Bhikkhu Buddha Dawson's favorites is atam mayata. Atam means I'm not going to do. The word tam is to do or to work. Like in Thai language, they have tam non, which is your salary, your, your work. So atam, maya, means I'm not going to have anything to do with that maya. I'm not going to put my arm on that hot stove anymore. So the question is, how deep into our rock bottom do we have to go before we actually see where we're headed, how dangerous it is, what the dangers are, so that we can come out soon rather than late. I know because I went pretty close to rock bottom a couple of times. Hmm. I don't what was that, that like anymore? Huh? What was that like? It was in the <laughs> Mupandito. <laughs> 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 
and and how did they handle that? What was the were you able to communicate to that that to them? And and if so, what was their instruction? I'd be curious of how that went. No, everybody was more interested in what they were doing than anybody's meditation. It I'm was sorry. really a celebration of the Upandita showing up. Hmm. Yeah, that does not sound like a good circumstance. I'm sorry that happened to you. Ouch. I'm not. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Wow, I'm not going to put my hand on that hot stove ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Had enough of that Mahasi stuff. <laughs> so that's the point of uh, that 16 stages of insight is when are we going to wake up and start practicing? Now, there's something very interesting about that, and that is what is step 16? It says is ongoing investigation of the dhammas. Now, that's how we start meditation. That's not how we end meditation. That's how we start it. That's the whole point. When, why do we have to wait to step 16 to start doing the investigation when we could do that investigation instead of noting? Well, to me, it's usually a review of what one has learned and a review of the stages and a review of the states of mind that arise and a review of what one has now learned about. So the, I think that the point of the, the word review is that it's something you've already learned to that point. And so one has an understanding and then one reviews the understanding that one has gained. It's like one has mm -hmm. built the wiring and now one checks out the, the device right. that one has constructed and what it's capable of perceiving. So again, how deep into the dukkha does zone have to go before they can see what's going on? Do they actually recognize it? And how bad do we have to hurt before we make the decision, I'm going to stop doing that? Well, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, I, I see people all the time that I just have no idea why they continued to put their hand on the stove or to, <laughs> to grind away at something that clearly was just making them more and more unhappy. I've, I've seen lots and lots of that in the Dhamma. And um well our which, which is why i like requires uh, uh, it our culture say that again? requires it our culture requires that we learned how to do all of those wrong things because our culture has been lying to us it's a whole bait and switch we've been told you do it this way and you'll get a good result and we keep doing it that way and we're not getting the results that we're looking for you mean so consuming and ruining the planet and running ourselves crazy and not getting happier Right. And uh, many examples of that is like the pocket rocket or the Mark Harley Davidson at the age of 40. They call it a midlife crisis. What is a midlife crisis with nothing but a 41 or 40 year old waking up to the fact that he has been lied to his whole life and he never got the reward that all that school and all that education, all that band practice and all of that football and all of that stuff in college and all of that job and all that house and all that wife and all of those kids and all that. And I still feel miserable. And so now they're ready for meditation if they really see the dukkha, but they still don't see the dukkha. So they go to the meditation hall and carry all their misery about their life into that meditation hall and say, oh, I can't deal with meditation. My plate's too full. <laughs> and then I think that inability to deal with meditation is often because the other two trainings were lacking. So the training in right effort, you know, right speech, mm -hmm. right view, um, th those right mindfulness, those were missing, and the you know uh, right concentration was missing. And so I think th a lot of people were missing the basic foundations. And when they go to attempt to meditate, it's like attempting you know rock climbing when you don't have the arm and leg muscles. It's just not going to work well. And so in the same kind of way, a lot of people they they didn't do a lot of the preliminary things that would have made uh, their meditation experiences a lot better. And while that is emphasized to some degree, I actually find that that a lot of places um, it's not emphasized nearly enough and that you don't, uh, it, a lot of the teachings I find in the West don't feel complete to me. Well, mostly they don't, that don't... preliminary, we will. Oh, somebody is cutting out. Mm, I think it's Tamarato. He may have, it, maybe his battery died. I, I find that a lot of the Western Dhamma looks very incomplete to me. I like the full old grand thing. 
and, and the richness of the full tradition is actually vast in terms of teaching of how to relate to other people, how to relate to oneself, how to be kind and loving, how to be skillful, how not to go chasing after things that will not produce happiness, how to um, avoid suffering. There's a tremendous amount in it. And what we get is this very stripped down small thing, which has some very nice elements to it, but it seems incomplete to me. And that's why I like all these big old books that I, I know um, most of those Damarato likes as well. And to get to see the, the full richness of the Dhamma and all its methods to reduce suffering in so many different ways. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? We've been talking a lot again, and hopefully Damarato will join us shortly again. What are, your, what are you thinking about this from your own experience? Well, I mean, from my own experience, I, I, don't, I don't think how... Oh, here he comes. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Hey, Damarato. I apologize on the behalf of the weatherman, the sky oh. daddy who is causing the rainstorm that we're in. Oh, yeah. Seems to have caused more problems. Oh, maybe something again has happened. The, the, my last topic that I was going to sort of throw in the mix, if if uh, you know, if we may not actually get to it now, is about stream entry actually, and about the differences between, or to explore any differences in in, in terms of the way that you both conceive of that. In my understanding of your way of thinking about it, Daniel, is that one whether one realizes it or not, and whether one's using a technique or not, those are all optional. One passes through the stages of insight to some degree, to some degree of intensity, and reaches that, as you described, that sort of cessation moment, the switching off, the switching on, and everything changes. It's a, it's a fundamental. That the vector of insight is a perceptual shift. That's your, if you like, technical definition of those path attainments. I would imagine that Damarata has a really rather different view. Well, it's a perceptual shift that also leads to existential shifts, that also leads to an upgraded relationship to sort of that layer of minds, sensations, and feelings, and thoughts. Most people report an increased spaciousness. Most people report an increased understanding of the Dhamma. Um, most people report uh, f increased faith. Most people report. So I actually have not many problems with the f technical definitions as you find them in most of Buddhism. The one thing I will say is that they often consider a stream enter a total master of morality, meaning they wouldn't break precepts or they wouldn't, you know, which is um, that I, I think is a little too far. I've seen people who, you know, at least from my point of view and, and in my own life, my own behavior would not not necessarily always meet my own highest standards after stream entry. And it kind of depends on what your standards are for master of morality. But, um, and so, uh, but I, I do, th I think we would actually be on relatively similar pages. Uh, if mm -hmm. one is really questioned, was it rites and rituals or was it clearly perceiving things? that made the transformation, you know, it, someone who had it happen in a rites and rituals context might be a little um, fuzzy on that point, but some others might say, no, it was just by cl clearly perceiving my mind. A and again, you know, the descriptive fallacy that everybody will describe this exactly the same way or using the same language I don't buy into. But, um, it, you know, having seen everything, including space and mind and everything disappear and reappear, can do something very, very profound. And it does seem to throw some switch. I mean, in my own life, and this is reported in texts that were written, you know, thousands of years before I was born, all of a sudden I was cycling much more rapidly through stages. I could easily navigate them very soon. I could even call them up by a number. I could get fruitions again. Mine would disappear and resynchronize. And suddenly the stages of everything were moving so much faster. I, it really did feel like suddenly I was in the swirl of something. Whereas before the, dham the Dhamma seemed like work. The Dhamma seemed like something I had to do most of the time. And if I didn't do it, not much was going on. There were exceptions. But then it felt like suddenly the mind was just in the swirl of the stream of the thing in a way that was utterly different and the stages moved through so much more quickly and I found the Dhamma pulling me onwards as if I was in a current rather than the other way around and the degree to which people re report or describe any of this exactly the same way varies but clearly there is something fundamental about the the physiology and the way the perception changes and the capabilities change so people talk about you know state changes 
trait changes, but I actually also think of capability changes where suddenly I could just access genres, like just by calling them up. I couldn't do that before. Suddenly I could, you know, within minutes get to equanimity in this vast open state of mind, which we previously, you know, had taken me, you know, 12 days and then six days on retreat. And suddenly I could just do that. And, and so there was this impressive upgrade, at least for me, and particularly as I was trained to explore all of the capabilities and options. So I come from a trad tradition that's very into exploring all the capabilities and mental upgrades and optionality that then may come online, which can take some development and some cultivation to really fully be able to utilize those just as one is given a car, but one might not be a great driver yet. Um, you know, one has the increased capabilities, one has to sort of learn to drive the full, you know, what all the buttons and gauges do. So ha having trained in that, I, I got to see for myself, wait a second, this does lead to the traditional upgrades that some of these old books explain, or at least a lot of them. And so I, I was very satisfied and I thought, well, this is good. And this seems to all make sense. And whether or not every, anybody else would necessarily agree, this was stream entry. You know, some of the Orthodox people are going to get all up in arms and debate this. We're going to see some, probably some somewhat negative comments in the comment stream, unfortunately. Wow. But in my own life, I found it very, very like, wow, confirming that the Dhamma was powerful, these techniques worked, that they did what they were supposed to do, and that I could see that in my own practice. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well I mean, my, my thoughts on it, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we should go there, honestly. <laughs> That's another story. But, but this is interesting, though. I remember when I, I was playing guitar, right, in, in my life. And when I was, first of all, uh, you know, in my teens, learning guitar, I learned all kind of tunes. And for example, I remember I learned some Metallica tunes. I learned some, uh, I learned some Metallica, tunes, some Megadeth, right, from that wonderful Rust in Peace album, fantastic album. I learned that kind of thing in those days. And then later on, much later on, when I was working as a guitarist, I eventually was uh, had, had a job uh, where I was to uh, be, if you want. Uh, go to the studio and record similar tunes some of these old tunes that i used to learn when i was a teenager and i had to record them as the standard as an exam standard uh, for um, an examination uh, board okay so they wanted my audio in other words to be the reference audio if you like of, of playing whatever it was i made and we had to do steve Vai, uh, you know things like that and so in in that process i had to go back and relearn the uh, songs that I learned in my teens and of course but with the advantage of 10 more years of and many many hundreds thousands perhaps uh, well, undoubtedly thousands of hours of practice and, and, and working experience so it's a totally different thing in revisiting those old songs and I heard things that I hadn't heard before I um, was playing things in my teen age years that I thought were right that weren't right my resolution in other words my level of resolution was significantly higher later on of course naturally so I'm wondering, you know, as we're going over these, you, know, you, you gave us a bit of a potted history of your, uh, you know, of your practice there with some of your early teachers and influences. And we've discussed that more in other episodes, you and I, when we've done our, just our duo episodes, interviews in the past. When you look back, I wonder if you recognize any areas of uh, now from your vantage point, low resolution in terms of the way you're pra approaching practice, that if you could have been your teacher, if you, if the, 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 this version of Daniel could go back to some of the previous versions of Daniel and help to navigate so, uh, some of these, uh, these tricky areas, how, how would you learn that Metallica solo with the benefit of your experience? Uh, I don't know if that's an interesting question, but it's, it's something that came to mind. It is. And I very much appreciate that. So I'm also a musician um, and I have like a seven string ESP LTD, you know, with EMGs uh, sitting right over there in, in stealth black or whatever it is. <laughs> and so I could I very much appreciate the difference in what my ear can hear now. It's funny as I practice less than I used to, but I listen more than I used to. I can hear more than I used to be able to hear, but I can play less of it as I don't spend as nearly as much time with my instruments now. I'm running the charity as I am. But I definitely know Notice the phenomena of being able to appreciate subtle nuances of tone, of time feel, uh, of even whole notes. There, there are little grace notes or things that I would have missed earlier. So I definitely appreciate that. And I've also appreciated that in my own practice. What I'm able to perceive and appreciate now is in some ways very different. Although it's interesting, my skill sets are different now. I actually wrote that 
book right there, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, in some ways as the book that I would have wanted that would have helped me correct errors or mistakes or deficiencies in my younger self. I actually in some ways wrote it for a younger me. So that is actually what that book is. If you're curious, you can find it online at mctb.org for free. Um, but so, so I did spend a lot of time thinking about that because there were things I missed. There were things that were imbalanced, the things that were incomplete. There were things I wished I had known. And yet from another point of view, I'm grateful for all the mistakes I got to make. I'm grateful for all the organic process because by in some ways not having some of the stuff that I would have had, had I been able to give that book to my younger self, I actually then explored a whole ton of other stuff, which it turns out was very useful. And I wouldn't have gone through that curious, broadening, horizon expanding process where I looked at so many other traditions and Christian mystics and Sufi mystics and and Tibetans and Zen and all this stuff that I hadn't had as much exposure to and Vedanta and, and Western ceremonial magic and, and all of these things. And so I'm actually in some ways grateful that I didn't have access to that book because it allowed me to get, I think, a lot broader um, in some ways, but in some ways not having that also definitely, I think, cost me some time when it comes to fundamental things. Um, I don't know if that is a helpful answer to your question. Uh, did that get at any of it? Mm. Yeah, certainly. I think it's been very interesting discussion. And of course, Damarato in the middle of a storm there in Thailand yeah. uh, lost it, lost his connection. But I think still we had a good long um, a good long time with him here and some really interesting exchanges. So uh, I don't know if you have any uh, reflections on this conversation. Usually at the end of these discussions, I give each of you a chance to do that. Of course, Damarato won't be able to do that. Um, do you have any reflections on that before we wrap it up? Yes. Since I've been teaching um, lots of people coming to me, you know, reaching out for help or discussion or validation or, you know, just someone to tell their story to or whatever it is from various traditions, there is a great range of how insight can present. And there's a great range of how various awakenings can look in various people. And there's, there's a great range of this stuff. So just because my own practice seemed to be oddly confirmatory, at least for me, of what I found in these particular old books here, that doesn't mean everybody else's practice is going to look like that. And when you look at the sequence of even what happened back in the day of how various practitioners looked and felt and what their capabilities were when they woke up, even in the old, you know, Pali canon stuff, and, and looking in the Vinaya, you find a great range of what it looked like. And so I've, got, I've gained an appreciation of that diversity that I did not have before is the one thing I would like to say. And so if your practice doesn't look like mine, well, fine, like tons of great practitioners practice doesn't look like mine. And that's okay. And the real question that each of you as an audience have to ask yourself is, is what I'm doing leading to less suffering, to more wisdom, to, to fulfilling your goals for your practice? And if not, why not? And to be able to critically look at that and think about what other options might be and realize that sometimes our answer to that question is going to change with time because that's the nature of the world. And so just to offer that as, as to, to you know, sort of try to avoid some of the comparison or the, the harsh critique that can sometimes come. I'm not saying my way is anything like the only way or the best my way or you know that my maps are the only way this unfolds or anything like that. Because sometimes when I say these kinds of things, I get people thinking that's what I'm saying or reacting as if that's what I'm saying. And that's not true. There's a tremendous range of, of things that lead to a reduction of suffering and increase of wisdom and a tremendous number of ways that those look. So that's the one thing I would offer. Mm. May I ask then, does that mean you've nuanced of you or perhaps never maybe it's a misconception of mine that you had that view, that all contemplatives go through this, that territory as described by that, uh, the 16 stages of insight, uh, that, so but that they may not recognize that they've gone through it and it may not appear uh, as very distinctly, et cetera, but they've got to go through that if they're going to uh, traverse the contempt. Have you knew, was that ever your view? Uh, and, better, and have you... For yeah, sorry, for better or for worse, I do think there is something physiological about these capabilities. So, but the r range of the way it can look is vastly wider than traditionally described. And, but actually, but then there's a whole nother Daniel. So there's the Daniel that was like a doctor. And then there's the Daniel that's like Daniel meditation teacher, meditator, author of that book and some other books over there and stuff. And, um, but then there's, 
the the Daniel that currently works like running the EPRC charity, and, you know, I'm sorry, the Emergence Benefactors Charity to support the research group, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, that looks at all of this, just one dude's opinion on the internet and goes, yeah, but we need to back that up with science, with good phenomenological studies, with good longitudinal studies of people's progress, with good neuroimaging, with, you know, with something much better than, you know, a bunch of people's expert opinions or whatever, or old texts, right? None of which meet the scientific rigor of what I would read really like. And so if people out there are interested in helping to support or fund that science, that we can get something vastly better than all these um, orthodoxies and experts arguing with each other and, you know, various, uh, you know, fans of theirs flaming, worrying each other and doing various things and getting into all this conflict. Let's actually do the science and, and get to a, a next level of evidence quality that helps resolve some of these old debates. That's what I'm really spending most of my time working for these days. And that's what I would greatly prefer. Um, and hopefully other people would as well. So and that's that what be, I would like to see in the world. And that could be found at, perhaps you could give us the, the address. Of course, I'll also th Yeah, sorry, T-H-E-E-P-R-C dot O-R-G and eBenefactors dot O-R-G. And this is the sort of third Daniel that looks at the previous two Daniels and goes, we could do so much better than that. And so a lot of this podcast has been kind of like second Daniel, but really like third Daniel, current Daniel, most of my time I'm working to figure out very ontologically agnostic, very, you know, phenomenology driven, very outcomes driven, like what leads to value, what leads to good outcomes for people, what leads to good care, what leads to good support, what leads to good you know, good things in people's lives, what leads to a reduction of suffering and increase of happiness and value. That's what I'm more interested in and looking at all the traditions and figuring out what's the best of that and what do each of these have to contribute and what does science have to say about this if done in a very, very neutral, honest, open way that isn't trying to come from any specific agenda. And, and I think that, the you know, the vast majority of you know, my stuff, as you'd find in like Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, that book is not going to be in anything like the final product. And what we will find will emerge, hopefully, very organically from the data and the patterns we see and the physiology we're able to figure out and reports of what does lead to good outcomes. And so that's what we're hoping to do and what I spend a lot of my time doing these days. Wonderful. Well, Daniel Ingram and absently, Damarato, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been delightful. I really appreciate this. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.